Hey, what's happening everybody? Sorry I cannot be there today, but hopefully this video will clarify some things for you. Uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm probably just going to do a few problems from each section uh, that I think are important, and then hopefully from there you'll be able to kind of extrapolate what you're supposed to do uh, for the remaining problems for this final review packet. So, the first section is section one. The instructions are find the exact value of all six trig functions for any angles, radians, or degrees that have a reference angle and that is a special triangle angle. It include, that includes negatives and multiple rotations. So basically, it's less complicated than you think. The first question here is 5 pi over 3, and we're just going to find all six trig values of it. So let me go ahead and put those on. So there we go. We're going to evaluate those six trig values. So basically, sine of 5 pi over 3, it's basically a six-question unit circle quiz. Uh, 5 pi over 3 is going to be in quadrant 4. That's going to be your negative rad 3 over 2. Cosine of 5 pi over 3, again, quadrant 4. That's going to be your 1 half. Tangent is going to be your negative rad 3. Once you find these three, the remaining three are not terrible. You just kind of flip the values, and then you just keep on moving. And... Um, there you go. So that's how you handle the first 10 problems. Uh, some of them involve multiple rotations, but uh, other than that, I think it's pretty straightforward. Let me uh, come back with the next section here. So here we go with some inverse trig. Uh, so basically, they're just asking you to find what angle produces that rad 3 over 2 for cosine inverse. And so remember the questions that we always run ourselves through when we see a problem like this. You know, cosine inverse pulls its values from quadrants 1 and 2. Quadrant 1, if the value is positive, quadrant 2, if the value is negative. In this case, the, the value of this rad 3 over 2 is positive, which means I know my answer will definitely come from quadrant 1. And quadrant 1 only. I'm not solving an equation, so we want to make sure we keep ourselves clear. There's only one angle in quadrant 1 that will produce this value, and that is pi over 6. So remember, I'm not finding two answers here. This is not the same thing as cos x equaling rad 3 over 2, which would produce two answers. They're not the same. So here I'm trying to find the basic angle, quadrant 1 angle, that produces this value. I am not solving an equation, in which case this would have produced two or more answers depending on the window that I'm solving on. So please keep that straight because people are going to get that messed up. On the final, I don't want to see that happen. So uh, with 4 being done, uh, let's go on to something a little more complicated like 18 from the same section. Now we're going to have some double, uh, some double trouble. And so sine of cotangent inverse of 7 over 6. Now one thing that I forgot to mention is um, if at any given moment I'm moving too fast, you know, please have your substitute teacher hit the pause button. That way you guys can catch up. You know, uh, don't be afraid to do that. Uh, I want to try and cram in as many problems as we can in the next 90 minutes. And so, uh, so I'm, and while I'm at it, let's not make a mistake, it's actually negative 7 over 6. So I'm taking inverse cotangent here. Now, one of the things that is often missed about inverse cotangent is the range, right? The range of inverse cotangent is from uh, 0 to pi, not from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, which means our unit circle quadrants of co inverse cotangent are going to be 1 and 2. This value here is negative, which means we are definitely pulling from quadrant 2. Now, the second problem with this problem is that negative 7 over 6, well, we don't really know readily where that is on the unit circle, but uh, but fortunately we can draw our cool quadrant 2 triangle here, where we now have um, the ad adjacent over opposite sides here, so I'm going to go negative 7 and 6 here as long as this angle was x. And so from here it's just Pythagorean theorem, uh, I'm going to go 36 plus 49. which is going to be rad 85. And remember, I'm taking sine of this triangle now. Remember, because out of this area, I'm going to get an angle, right? And when I take sine of that angle right here, I'm just going to go opposite over hypotenuse. So my final answer is 6 over rad 85. Again, a couple of things that are really treacherous about the problem. One, we don't know what uh, negative 7 over 6 is on the unit circle. Two, inverse cotangents, negative angles are pulled from quadrant two, so keep that in mind. So let me go ahead and hit pause real quick. I'm going to clean up the board, and then uh, we will um, keep going.
Okay, here comes section three. I hope you guys prepared your qigong and did some meditation because we have an identity. So, first thing you want to do, pick a side. Pick a side that gives you more to work with, that gives you more energy, or pick a side that you feel gives you the better opening. And so, what I'm going to do, most people usually go for the left. Uh, I'm actually going to attack the right side. I feel like the right side is going to be a more of a direct, more of a direct strike on onto the onto the problem. And so. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use a maneuver that we don't use very often. I'm going to actually multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate of the top. And keep in mind, we, I don't talk about this very often in this particular class, but when it comes to multiplying by conjugates, there are places where you want to be ambitious and there are places where you don't want to be ambitious. And what I mean by that is you definitely want to multiply the conjugated side because what that gives you is it gives you the, the difference of two squares, which is what you want when you multiply it out. But the bottom, you know, it's not necessarily important to, uh, to do that, at least not yet. And I feel like we might do this eventually, but just not, not, uh, not super uh, quickly right now. I know that the uh, 1 minus cosine squared x is going to become a sine squared x based on our Pythagorean identities. From here, you know what, I think I am going to actually distribute this out. And what we get is we get tan x minus tan x cos x. And then from here, I feel, I feel like we can mess with this a little bit because we're getting there. We already have a sine and a tangent. So again, just follow the problem's energy and see where the energy takes you. you know, it's, like, it's like playing push hands. You know, you just gotta, whoops. Um, you just have to kind of flow. Tangent becomes sine over cosine with a cosine up top remaining. Goodbye to those. And finally, you end up with sine squared over tan x minus sine x. And hey, what do you know? That is what you were going for the entire time. So there goes your identity. Uh, I'm going to move forward, actually. Uh, I'm not going to label this section uh, quite yet. I'll, I'll, I'm going to do something from section four. They're basically the same concept uh, using, using uh, some identities here. Uh, I'll go ahead and do number three from section four. All right, so I know it goes 6-3, but make sure, you guys, this is section 4, so make sure you guys are writing this down. Um, cosine of 3 pi over 2 minus x. From here, they're just asking you to simplify um, using a sum and difference uh, expansion. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that we have cos of 3 pi over 2 cos x plus, right, because of the whole minus thing on the inside, sine of 3 pi over 2 and sine x. Remember, the negative doesn't impact the actual angle, it's just going to uh, impact the interaction. Cosine of 3 pi over 2 is nothing, that thing goes away. Sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1, so we end up getting negative sine. Very cool. All right, let's, uh, let's do some graphs in a second. Let me go ahead and uh, switch to the next section and clean off the board. All right, here we go. Let's graph a couple things here. So, number 15 in section 5 here, we're going to graph this function right here. So let's just identify what we have. We don't have any vertical shift. Our amplitude is 3. And uh, let's see, the new period. Well, that's going to be the original period divided by the frequency, which is going to be 2 pi times 6 over pi. I'm thinking that the new period is 12. And we have a phase shift of 4 to the right. So let's go ahead and uh, get all this stuff down here. All right, so there's no vertical shift, but the sign is upside down. Keep that in mind because of the whole negative bit here. So I'll go ahead and just draw my pre-phase shifted sign. Okay. And, oops. and a little bit more to the back. Okay, cool, here we go. This marker right here is 12. Halfway is 6, halfway between the halfway is 3, and 3 quarters of the way is 9. This back way here is going to be negative 3. And we're being phase shifted to the right by 4, so let's go ahead and just change colors here. So, this negative 3, everything, everything's going to move over by 4, which means I don't, I don't have clear markers here. I'm just going to move a little bit to the right of the 3 here, so one more space over is going to get me to 4. So that's where my first space is going to be. This 3 is going to move down here, which is going to be at 7. This 6 is going to move over here, which is going to be 10. 
This 9 is going to move over here, which is going to be 13. This 12 here is going to move to 16. And then this negative 3 is going to move here, which is going to be about 1. And then I just graph it. Whoa. There we go. And there we go. Cool. So that's, uh, that's the first graph right there. Give me a second. I will put the next one up in a little bit. All right, we are doing number 11 from section 5. And so, um, as always, please ask the uh, substitute teacher, if possible, for them to pause in case you guys need to write the problems down. Uh, but we are doing number 11 from uh, section 5. And so I want to draw your attention to this because we've never really seen this situation before where we have this one half that's on the inside. Um, before we factor or even identify any of the parts, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to factor out that one half. And what that's going to give me is 2 sine 1 half with an x on the inside. Now if I subtract out, or rather if I factor out a, um, a 1 half, that leaves me with pi over 3 on the inside. And so, uh, so make sure you keep that in mind. So the phase shift is actually not going to be pi over 6. It's going to be pi over 3, so just keep that in mind as we move forward here. The vertical shift is still 3. The amplitude is still going to be 2. The new period is going to be 2 pi divided by 1 half, which is 4 pi. And then the uh, phase shift is going to be pi over 3 to the right. So let's see how this pans out here. And so I'm just going to actually go and draw this a little bit down here because I know that there is no way that I am going to be below the x-axis. So uh, with my vertical shift being 3, the highest I could go would be 5, and the lowest I could go would be 1. So I'm going to go and graph this sine curve pre-phase shifted. Okay, and then here comes my little piece in the back. So let me go ahead and um, mark that off there. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and mark down the places here. So this is going to be 4 pi, 2 pi, 1 pi, and 3 pi. This little space behind here is going to be negative pi. And so now, if we're going to move everything pi thirds, well, that's just going to move everything over a third of a space, right? So I'm going to go over a third of a space and go here. This is pi thirds, right? And so what I'm going to do actually before I even do this is I'm going to go ahead and relabel all the points. Let me change colors one more time because this is kind of hard. Like I, you know, doing the whole, you know, common denominator thing isn't really my thing. So I'm going to call this 3 pi over 3. Instead of 2 pi, I'm going to call it 6. Hopefully you guys can see that, but 6 pi over 3. Um, I'm going to call this, instead of 3, I'm going to call it 9 pi over 3 again. I hope you guys can see that. Uh, maybe if I did it in red. There we go. 3 pi over 3. There you go. 6 pi over 3. And then 9 pi over 3. And then this is going to become 12, 12 pi over 3. And this is going to become negative 3 pi over 3. And the reason why I did that is because it just helps me find the common denominator. And on top of that, it just helps me when it comes to shifting things to the right. I now know that 0 becomes pi over 3. I know that uh, pi over 3 is going to become 4 pi over 3, right? So I know it's going to get shifted to the right by this much. And that's going to now become 4 pi over 3. I know that 6 pi over 3 is going to go a third over to become 7 pi over 3. 9 pi over 3 is going to become 10 pi over 3. And then 12 pi over 3 is going to become 13 pi over 3. And then negative 3 pi over 3 is going to become negative 2 pi over 3. And now there's a lot of colors on the board, but I think if I just keep myself as aligned as possible, I can pretty much knock out this graph. And as long as my hand doesn't stick to the tablet, I should be somewhat cool. And I think I'm okay. Alright, 
So I think that is uh, that is the two graph uh, the graphs that I'm going to do for this section, um, and then uh, yeah, we'll move forward into the next section. Okay, we are on section six, and uh, section six is all about solving trig equations. Now, one of the things you need to really be careful of is knowing the window and the unit under which you are being asked to solve. So remember, with trig equations, um, your answers will always be the same, but how you present your answers is going to change depending on how they ask. And so in number two here, the instructions are find all solutions uh, under 0 to 2 pi. So basically, what they're saying is we want to find all the answers under this one cycle window. All right, and it's going to be in radians because I see this 2 pi right here. So when it comes to number 2, um, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to go ahead and change out this cos squared x because one of the problems that I have with this is that I have cos and sine. I need things in terms of one trig function. That way I can solve for it. So using a Pythagorean identity, I know that cos squared is 1 minus sine squared x. And that's going to equal sine x plus 1. Eventually all this stuff's going to move over, but let's just distribute first. 2 minus sine squared x minus sine x minus 1 equals 0. So I just moved everything over and I distributed it at the same time. Hopefully that wasn't too fast. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and combine out like terms. Negative 2 sine squared x minus sine x plus 1 equals 0. Um, you know, I'm not going to lie. I really don't enjoy factoring when the leading coefficient is negative. So let's multiply everything by negative 1 because I can. The other side's equal to 0. It's not going to change anything. So I have 2 sine squared x plus sine x minus 1 equals 0. Now this maneuver here seems, I don't want to take a second and talk about this. This, this maneuver here is, is really helpful to me. You know, um, if you want to try and be a hot shot and factor with a negative, if you, if you make a mistake, I have warned you. So make sure you guys are uh, just making things as simple for you as possible. You know, just because something is difficult doesn't mean that that's the right way to do it. So let's factor this out. 2 sine x and sine x. Uh, you know, there's only one way to get the 1, which is 1 and 1. The question is, where does the plus and where does the minus go? I'm pretty sure the minus goes here and the plus goes here, because I want to create a positive sine x in the middle. So sine x is going to equal 1 half, and sine x is going to equal negative 1. So what we've got is, remember I'm solving on 0 to 2 pi, which means I'm not going to have any plus minus 2 pi n here. I'm not solving for all real numbers. So this is going to be x is equal to, where does sine x equal 1 half? Well, remember, now I'm solving an equation, right? So sine is positive in two quadrants. The first quadrant is, well, quadrant 1, uh, pi over 6. And the second quadrant is going to be 5 pi over 6 in literally quadrant 2. Sine x is going to equal uh, negative 1 at 3 pi over 2. And again, why am I not adding the plus minus 2 pi n at the end of this? Because I'm only looking at one cycle of, of the unit circle here. So there's going to be only three places where this is true. So keep that in mind. Remember, the window is 0 to 2 pi, which means uh, that is why my answers are restricted. OK, let's take a look at something a little more difficult, like number 6. Number 6 is sine of 2x is equal to 2 fifths. OK we have a problem. And the problem is that 2 fifths isn't readily known from the unit circle. But that doesn't stop us from finding out where sine equals that anyway. So what you do is you set your calculator to radian mode, and then you take inverse sine of both sides. Remember, you were doing the same thing here, right? You were taking inverse sine of both sides, and you knew that the other angle was going to be at 5 pi over 6. Uh, so this is, it's, it's going to be the same thing. So what I have here is instead of x equaling a certain number, I have 2x equaling that number. And sine inverse of 2 fifths is going to give me um, 0 0.41151. Now, I'm actually going to add 2 pi to this, even though it's restricted. Now, why am I doing that? It's because of this little piece right here. Change colors again. Frequency change. This means that sine is happening more times on this window than once, which means I have to change the, change the period of this, of this function, which is what I'm going to do in a second. But before I do that, let me move this over here just slightly. 
um, I have to keep in mind that this is quadrant one right here. When I took inverse sine of the two fifths, it put me in quadrant one. I know sine exists somewhere else. It exists in quadrant two, exactly like the problem that was over here, right? The, you know, so the 0 0.41151 is analogous to the pi over six answer, right? The, they're both the quadrant one version of the answer. The next one that I'm going to find is analogous to the five pi over six answer. It's going to be the one that's in quadrant two. Well, how do I find that? What I do is I take pi and I subtract my reference angle, which is the quadrant one. We've been through this before, where it's going to be pi minus this thing. So what we end up getting is 2.7300 plus 2 pi n. Okay. And so uh, from here, I'm going to go ahead and divide by 2 on everything. x is going to equal this number divided by 2 ends up being 0 0.2057 plus pi n. This number here ends up becoming x is equal to 1.365 plus pi n. And now from here, uh, I'm going to go and just convert these out. The, uh, you know, pi is about 3.14, so 3.14n, 0 0.2057, and uh, 1.365 plus 3.14n. Now, just like the frequency change problems in the past where we knew the values exactly, I'm going to start cycling this until I exceed 2 pi. Now, in the past with these, we were able to do it um, so that we could have a numerator to compare with a denominator. We don't have that this time, which means I am going to um, not want to exceed a particular number still. 2 pi is about 6.28 if 3.14 is, uh, is, is pi. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let n equal 0, 1, and 2, and dot, 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 until I exceed 6.28 in the calculator. So I would like you to have your calculator out so that you can follow along. It's not going to take that long. When n equals 0, this guy goes away. I end up with 0 0.2, uh, whoops, uh, 0, 5, 7. When n equals 1, I have 3.14 plus this number. That becomes 3.3457. Now, I think you guys will see, see where this is going. When n equals 2, I already have 6.28 plus this number. That, that's going to be over. All right? So I don't, I don't even need that answer. So here, I'm going to do it again. n equals 0, I get 1.365. n equals 1, I get 1.365 plus 3.14. That's going to be 4.505. And then when n equals 2, I get 6.28 plus this number. That is even more over -er than this guy. So just, you know, you're gone. And those are the four answers that we want. So I hope that was clear. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'll be back if you guys have any questions on Monday. But let's move on to uh, some more problems here. Let me pause and clean up the board a little bit, and we'll keep going with some section 6. So here we are. We are back in section six. We're going to move forward into problem number 11 here. A pretty straightforward, easy kind of problem here. But notice how the uh, presentation of the answers has changed. They're now asking us to go on 0 to 360. It is still a restricted trig function on a full period of sine, but now everything's in degrees. And so I want to make sure I present my answers as such. One thing that, uh, that I really want to hit hard with this problem here is that to get theta isolated and to solve this equation ultimately, I am not going to be dividing both sides by sine or negative sine or anything because if I eliminate a sine here and I eliminate a sine here, I've effectively eliminated an answer and I don't want to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add sine to both sides. So it's 2 sine squared theta uh, plus sine theta is equal to 0. Now from here, I'm in a good position to factor out that sine. So I have 2 sine theta plus 1 is equal to 0. From here, zero product property happens. I get sine theta um, is equal to 0, and sine theta is equal to negative, whoa, 1 half. And so from here, I think they're just basic unit circle values. As long as you know where sine theta equals 0, that's 0 and normally pi, but this would be 180. And in fact, because the 360 is hard bracketed off, I'm going to include that as well. Okay, so make sure you guys keep that in mind. Notice the hard bracket here. 
uh, that means that we actually do include the 360 this time, even though it's in the same terminal position as zero, because they asked us to, we will give them what they asked us for. So where does sine theta equal negative one half? Well, that's in quadrants three and four, normally seven pi over six and 11 pi over six. As long as you know how to use reference angles, it's not hard. Pi over six is 30 degrees. So if I went to 180, right, if I went to 180, I'd have to go 30 more to get there, which is 180 plus uh, 30, which is gonna be 210. And then from here, same thing, I go all the way around, which is 360 minus 30, that would be 330. So those are my answers. So that's it for degrees. I'm gonna do another problem here in a little bit. Let me just post it up real quick and clean up this board. Okay, here we go. So again, just like the last problem, I'm not going to divide both sides by tangent. I don't want to be eliminating the answers here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, subtract tangent from both sides. And what that allows me to do is factor out a tangent. And now I have, whoops, not equals. Um, I have 4 tangent theta minus 3 equals 0. And so now tangent of theta will either equal zero or tangent of theta will equal three-fourths. And so from here, this one is relatively simple. Theta will either equal zero, 180, or 360, just like sine. But then this one here is a little more complicated. We've got to use some calculator work here. So switch the calculator to degree mode, and then you end up taking inverse tangent of three-fourths. You get 36.869 degrees. And then to get in the third, the third quadrant, remember this is going to be the first quadrant angle. To get the third quadrant angle, I'm going to do 180 plus that much. So it's going to end up becoming 216.869 degrees as well. Okay, cool. Let me go ahead and pause and go to the next set of problems here. Here we go with number 20. And so a couple things have changed. One, we are back into radians. Second, we are now solving for every single answer on the unit circle that could ever exist from before time until long after time is over. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and first off take care of the first problem here, and that is we have cos 2x happening here. This is not to be confused with cos squared x. So uh, this is a double angle conversion. Now remember, there are three iterations of double angle that you have to keep in mind. The one that I'm going to choose is this one. And the reason why I'm choosing this one is because I want to keep things, as always, in terms of one trig function strictly. So that allows me to do this rather than using the cos squared minus sine squared version. So when I combine out like terms, I get 2 cos squared x plus 3 cos x minus 2 equals 0. And then I think this thing can factor. I got 2 cos x here, cos x here. I think if I throw down a 1 and a 2, I think I'm going to be OK. I'll end up with 4 cos, 1 cos. That can get me to 3 cos as long as this cos is positive and this cos is negative. Now, this is a very advantageous situation because I know that cos x equaling negative 2 is no solution. So we're good. That guy's done. So cos x equaling 1 half, though, is going to provide a couple of solutions. Now remember, this is for x is equal to all real numbers. So my, um, my angle here is going to be in quadrant 1 or quadrant 4, uh, or rather, it's going to be in both. So I know that x equaling pi over 3 is going to be an answer. And I know that x equaling 5 pi over 3 will also be an answer. Now, because this is going to be for all real numbers, I now tack on plus minus 2 pi n here, where n is equal to 0, 1, 2, dot, dot, dot. Now, some of you might see this later on, where you see x is equal to negative pi over 3, plus minus 2 pi n for the same reason. Now, one of the things that I want to clarify in this is that, remember, 5 pi over 3 is in the same terminal position as negative pi over 3. It just depends on how you get there. 5 pi over 3 goes all the way around. Negative pi over 3 goes straight. But remember, if you're going to add 2 pi n to negative pi over 3, you end up in the same terminal position, which is exactly where you were at here. So either one of these works. Just keep that in mind. 
Uh, I'm okay with either. Um, so that would be your number 20. Let me clean up the board and uh, we will do the next one. Um, and so the next one I want to take on is going to be number 24. Again, it's going to require a little bit of conversion for us here. So sine of 2x is equal to 3 cos x. Now, check it out. Sine 2x can only convert into one thing. And remember, guys, this is not sine squared. It's sine 2x. So I'm going to use double angle formula here. This is going to be 2 sine x cos x is equal to 3 cos x. Now from here, again, I'm not going to s divide everything by cosine. That's going to eliminate an answer. I'm going to subtract cosine. So 2 sine x cos x minus 3 cos x is equal to 0. Now, the reason why I bring up this problem is because in the past few problems, I said specifically, we want to get things in terms of one trig function as much as possible. But here we still have sine and cosine, so how do I deal with that? Well, I think I still have things in terms of one trig function as long as I knew that I could factor out the cos. And if I do that, that gives me 2 sine x minus 3 on the inside. And now I do have things in terms of one trig function, which is really advantageous. And another advantageous thing is sine x equaling 3 halves here. Now again, that is going to provide no solution for the same reason that cos of negative 2 uh, or cos x equaling negative 2 provided no solution. So all we have to deal with is this guy right here. So from here, x can equal pi over 2 plus minus 2 pi n, or 3 pi over 2 plus minus 2 pi n, where n is equal to 0, 1, 2, dot, dot, dot. Now another way you could have done that is you could have just done uh, pi over 2 plus minus pi n because your answers are 180 degrees apart, I will take either one. So, uh, so that's it for this. Let me go and clean up the board again, and then I will select the next two problems for us to do. Hold on for one second, please. Cool, here comes the last problem from section six. Uh, sine two theta equals rad three over two. Relatively straightforward problem. Again, this is gonna be, whoops, not x this time. Uh, for theta being in the set of all real numbers. So this is an unrestricted trig function in degrees this time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find out, well, where does sine equal rad 3 over 2? Well, by taking inverse sine on both sides, you have to know that that's going to be true at pi over 3 radians, but we're working in degrees, so that's going to be 60 degrees. Now, uh, because of the frequency change, I would normally add the plus 2 pi n, but again, we're working in degrees this time, not radians, so it's going to be 360 n. All right, And so from here, I have to find out where that happens again. Well, that's true in quadrant 2 as well, so it's not just 60 degrees, but it's also true at 120 degrees plus, whoops, 360 n as well. Now, a couple things. One, because this is for all real numbers, it's not just plus, it's plus or minus, but depending on how you define n, how I define n, I define n in terms of positive whole numbers, so I need the minus. If you define n in terms of integers, then you're free to just use plus, but make sure you are clear. Divide everything by 2. Relatively straightforward problem, I think. Uh, you get 30 plus minus uh, 180n, and then um, you end up getting 60 plus minus 180n. And then again, just define your n as 0, 1, 2, dot, 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 or any integer whatever gets the job done for you. So that is section six. I will be back with section seven in a little bit. All right, let's take a look at the sinusoidal app from section seven. It says low tide in San Diego on October 13th, 2015 occurred at 4 a.m. The depth of the water at the Scripps Pier in La Jolla at that time was 1.06 feet. The next high tide occurred on the same day at 10 a.m. when the water depth was 5.98 feet. So we got to sketch a graph and all the rest. So pretty straightforward sinusoidal lab problem. I'm going to go ahead and draw this graph here. We know that the first time is 4 a.m. So I'm going to go ahead and mark down the 4. This dot here ends up being 1.06 feet high. It also tells me right here that at 10 a.m. <coughs> the highest tide is there, so it's 5.98. Now assuming this is sinusoidal, sorry, this is a 9, 
assuming that this is sinusoidal, the next low tide would occur at 1600 hours, or in this case, 4 p.m. So it would be down here. Whoops, I just realized I forgot to. I put the dot in the wrong place. So if I was to connect these, they would look like some iteration of negative cos. So here's the graph. I'm going to write the equation. So I'm going to find this midline here. To find the midline, I take the high point, the low point, I add them together, and I divide by 2. That becomes 3.52. Again, 5.98 plus 1.06 divided by 2 is 3.52. The equation for this is going to be y equals. <clears throat> I need the amplitude. So that's going to be the distance between the 5.98 and the 3.52. If I subtract those two, I get 2.46. I'm going to keep it negative because I'm going to phase shift my cosine to the right by 4. It's going to be cos t minus 4 and then plus 3.52. My frequency is going to be found with my period. So the period is 12 hours, which means the frequency is going to be 2 pi divided by that 12, which is going to be pi over 6. So part A is done. <clears throat> Part B, find all times on October 13th when the depth of the water was 4 feet. So I set y equal to 4, I get negative 2.46 cos pi over 6 times t minus 4 plus 3.52. So I'm going to get cosine by itself. What I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract 3.52 from both sides, cancel those out. Whatever this number is, I'm also going to divide by negative 2.46 on both sides. So what I get is I get negative 0 0.1951295512 equals cosine pi over 6 t minus 4. Again, how did this number get born again? How did this number get born? Well, it was born by taking 4, subtracting 3.52 and then dividing negative 2.46. So from here, I'm going to take inverse cos of both sides. What I get is, I'm going to scroll down here. What I get is I get pi over 6 times t minus 4. Again, taking inverse cos gets rid of the cos. Cosine inverse of this negative value gets me 1.76717. Eight one one seven plus minus two pi n. Now, why is it plus minus here? It's plus minus here because it is very likely that I could have some times before four a.m. where the tide might have been four feet high. Okay, so I'm going to go plus minus on that. Another thing to note, as we've discussed before, I took cosine inverse of a negative value that places me in quadrant two. I need to find the version that exists in quadrant three. How do I do that? Well, I take the number that I found, this 1.76717 number, and I go 2 pi minus that, which gives me 4.5160071991. Again, this is 2 pi minus the 1.76717817 number. And again, why did I do that? Because cosine is also negative in quadrant 3. And just like the other one, I'm going to throw down a plus minus 2 pi n. From here, it's just algebra with some really complicated looking stuff. To get t by itself, I'm going to multiply both sides by 6 over pi. And I'm going to do that twice because I have two scenarios here. So what I have is t minus 4 is equal to, uh, this is going to become the distributive property. So what I get is 1.76717817 times 6 divided by pi becomes 3.37506159.2. Again, distributive property. The pi is going to knock out 6 times 2 is 12n. <clears throat> On the right side, I get t minus 4 is equal to, again, distributive property. The 4.51 number times 6 divided by pi ends up becoming 8.62493840 plus minus 12n. From here, I'm going to add 4 to everything. 
I'm going to add 4, I'm going to add 4. So what we get is we get t equals 7.375. Again, I'm going to round to three decimals at the end because I'm pretty much there, plus minus 12n. I get t equals, equals 12.625. Plus minus 12n. Now the reason why I did this is because part B says I need to find all the times on October 13th when the depth of the water was four feet. So all the times on October 13th are going to be within this time frame here. Now something to something important to note is that whenever we solve a trig equation, we have a window, right? At least in these senses, we have a window. You have to think about what the window is and what makes sense. In this case, the window should not exceed, not exceed 24 right t should not exceed 24 because after 24 hours you are in um, October 14th so we don't want that so in this case it's easy to look at the window as 0 to 24 because I, if I get anything negative then I'm in October 12th I want everything on the same day so keep that in mind so that's what's gonna that's what that's what I'm gonna use as my baseline when I let n equal various values so when n equals 0, I get 7.375. If I let n equal 1, I get 19.375. And I could subtract the value also. But if I do, I'm going to get 7 minus 12. That's a negative value. That puts me back on October 12th. I don't want to be there. And if I let n equal 2, well, that's already 24 plus 7. That's way over. And if I subtract, I'm way under. So n equals 2 is not even up for consideration. So here we go. Same thing here. If t, I'm oh, sorry, not t, um, n, n equals 0, I would get 12.625. Great, I'm all good. n equals 1. I would get 24.625 if I added. Again, just slightly over the 24. Places me on October 14th, I don't want to be there. But I could subtract the 12 and get 0 0.625. And that would be the next time we were four feet deep in the tide. So that is the sinusoidal app. I will be back with the last problem in section seven. So for this problem here, uh, we're going to estimate the height of a mountain above a level plane. Angle of elevation at the top of the mountain is measured to be 32 degrees. 1,000 feet closer to the mountain along the plane, it is found the angle of elevation is 35 degrees. Estimate the height of the mountain. So Typical Algebra 1 kind of SOHCAHTOA math type problem with trig. Uh, first thing to do, guys, in every single word problem, if possible, draw a picture of it. Because honestly, pictures are, you know, they really are worth a thousand words. So let's, uh, let's draw this mountain here. <clears throat> so here, we're trying to estimate the height of the mountain. So it's no surprise, I want to solve for h. Now at this point, if the dude is standing right here, his line of sight is 32 degrees high. And it turns out if he walked closer, his elevation height would change. It would be 35 degrees. Now, the question that I asked in class was, how far away is he from the mountain? Well, the obvious answer is we don't know. They didn't tell us that. And it's a good thing they didn't tell us that, because that leaves it up for interpretation. We can call this x, because we don't know how far away he is. All we know is that when he moved 1,000 feet closer, the angle of elevation changed. So what I want to find now is this distance right here. How far is that? Well, it's 1,000 feet closer than this distance. So it would be whatever this distance is minus 1,000 feet. Hopefully that makes sense. <clears throat> so from here, we have a bit of a way to set this up. So what I need is I need a relationship between this 32 degrees, this h, and this x. Because I'm dealing with the large triangle right now, the large triangle. So if you looked at it, you could see it as two different triangles, where this is 32, h, and x. And then you could look at it as the other triangle, which has the larger elevation angle to be 35. This would be x minus 1,000 and h. See, these h's are the same, right? So I think hopefully you, gotta, you guys kind of have an idea of where this problem might be going. In the yellow triangle, which is the bigger triangle in this case, uh, it would be the relationship between the angle, this 
opposite side and this adjacent side would be tangent because tangent is opposite over adjacent. From here, I'm going to get h by itself, so I'm going to multiply by x. So I know that x times tan 32 is equal to h. And on the other triangle here, it's the same relationship. Tangent of 35 is equal to h over x minus 1,000. Kick this guy over. I get tan 35 times x minus 1,000 equals h. The good thing about these h's is that they're the same because they're dealing with the same mountain, so I can set them equal to each other. So what I have is, I'm going to go and distribute this. I have x tan 35 minus 1,000 tan 35 is equal to x tan 32. And now I'm going to solve for x. What I get is I'm going to subtract this dude over. I get x tan 32 minus x tan 35 is equal to negative 1,000 tan 35. From here, one of my favorite maneuvers in all of algebra, I'm going to factor out the x. I get x tan 32 minus tan 35, sorry about the handwriting, is equal to negative 1,000 tan 35. And if you've been paying attention, then you know this is my favorite line. I am going to divide by the big thing. 32 minus tan 35 over the same thing. So I get x equals negative 1,000 tan 35 over tan 32 minus tan 35. OK. Important to note, if you've gotten this far, it is easy to make a mistake. Make sure your calculator is in degree mode, because we are not dealing with a motion problem. So if your calculator is in degrees and you divide all this out, you should get 9294.199, or 191 rather, 191599. Five nine nine. Sorry about that. Okay, so it's easy at this point to walk away and say, yep, I'm done with the problem. Cool. It's all good. And you know what's going to happen if you do that, right? I don't need to explain that again. We're solving for h, not x. We're solving for h, right? So I'm going to pick the safest place to plug in this number, and that's going to be right here. So I take 9294.191. 599, and I multiply that by tan 32, and that's going to be h. Do that in the calculator, you end up getting 5807.655, and that is your answer. All right, let's move on to the next section. All right, so let's continue on with section 8 on the final review packet. And so uh, we're back to logarithms, you know, one of the real critical pieces of, of pre-calc. So let's go ahead and start expanding some logarithms here. I'm going to go ahead and do uh, number 5. And it looks like this. Log base 3 of AB cubed over C to the 4th. Now, again, the instructions are just to expand this out using log A and log B. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just expand it. And so I've got two things being multiplied up top, one thing being divided on the bottom. I've got some addition and subtraction going on if I'm going to separate these logs. So I've got log base 3 of A plus log base 3 of B cubed uh, plus, just kidding, when I say plus, I really mean minus uh, log base 3 of C to the fourth. Now from here, the last thing that I need to do is pull both of these exponents down. That way I finally end up with log base 3 of A plus 3 log base 3 of B minus 4 log base 3 of C. Now it's only after writing this out that I'm going to realize something. And that is, some of you guys may feel tempted to do that. That is actually going to be the wrong thing. Um, this does not equal 1. The 3 would have to be in the answer portion of the, of the logarithm for it to become 1. So actually, this is as far as you can go with this problem. So, uh, so there, you, 
there you have it. That is Section 8, Expanding Logarithms. Make sure you guys keep those logarithm formulas in mind that are really important in calculus. Uh, let's move on to Section 9. Uh, let's just do a quick uh, exponential growth or decay problem. I'll pick uh, number 6 here. It reads, Keith has saved $2,000 for a synthesizer that will cost $2,500. If he puts the money into an account that pays 7.25% compounding continuously, how long will it be until Keith has enough money for the synthesizer? Okay, so a couple of things that are really important about this problem here. One is that the interest rate is compounded continuously, which means this is the formula that will be utilized. Um, the, the worksheet says it looks like this. They are the same thing. They are the same thing. Just replace the Y with an A and Y sub zero or Y not with, um, with a P. And so let's just go ahead and get ready to rock and roll. I'm going to identify all the pieces here. What's A, what's P, what's E, what's R, and what's T? Well, I know that Keith has $2,000, so that's going to be his initial amount, right? And then he's eventually going to want to have $2,500 for his synthesizer. E is not going to change. R is 7.25%, which is going to be 0 0.00725. So make sure you keep the decimals straight there. And then T is the thing that we're solving for. How do we know? It's because it says, how long will it be until Keith, right? And so whenever we read the words, how long will it be, that is going to be the, uh, the key ingredient in our problem as to what we're going to solve for. So let's go ahead and get rid of rock and roll here. We have 2,500 equals 2,000 e <coughs> to the 0 0.0725 t. Knock off two zeros there. 25 over 20 equals e to the 0 0.0725 t. Uh, there's no way that 25 over 20 and E are going to have the same base, so let's go ahead and take the natural logs of both sides. The natural log and the E will knock each other away. I've got the natural log of 25 over 20 is equal to 0 0.0725T. Solving for T gives me, uh, or allows me to divide both sides by 0 0.0725. So those go away. I end up with t equals, and let's calculate it. And so uh, 20 divided by 25. I am getting 3.077. So it looks like it's about three years for Keith to have enough money for his synthesizer. So he should probably invest the money and also get a job, perhaps wearing a red apron that makes him vend sodas for 250 as long as the diets are in the front row. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the next section. Give me a second, I'll clean off the board. Here we go, some more logarithms for us. Section 10 is gonna have us solving a logarithmic equation. And so, what we have to remember here is we're going to work backwards compared to the last section. We are going to actually combine out logarithms. And then when after we get done combining out the logarithms, then we're going to switch forms and solve and everything. So what I've got is we've got two logarithms being added, which means I can write this as log base 5 of 7 plus x times 8 minus x. And because of this minus log base 5 of 2 here, we can go ahead and divide the whole thing by 2, and that's going to equal 2, right? This 2 on the other side of the equal sign didn't go anywhere. So from here, uh, we can actually effectively change forms at this point. So what we have is we have the base being 5, the exponent being 2, which is this guy, 5 squared equaling um, 7 plus x times 8 minus x over 2. So from here, I'm going to do a couple of things at the same time. I know that 5 squared is 25. I know I'm going to cross multiply. So I can say that this is 50. Okay, so again, what did I do? I squared the 25. I cross multiplied. I got 50. That's the easy part. The hard part is factoring this weird looking thing here. So let's go ahead and see if we can't handle it. 56 minus 7x plus 8x minus, be careful, it's minus x squared. So from here, let's move all of the stuff to the left side. I know it seems counterintuitive because, um, because actually, before I do that, <coughs> there we go. 
let's clean that up a little bit. I know it seems a little bit counterintuitive to move everything over to the left side, but again, as always, I don't like trying to be a hot shot and factoring out something with a negative exponent or a negative leading coefficient. So uh, if I subtract 56 from both sides, I get negative 6. If I subtract the x, I get negative x. And if I add the x squared, I get positive x squared. And that's all going to equal 0. I think this is going to factor. I think, I'm thinking x minus 3 and x plus 2. So what we're, th what we're seeing here is x could equal 3 or negative 2. Now, ordinarily, it might not be a bad idea to disclude the negative 2 automatically. However, I feel like negative 2 might work. Because if I punch in a negative 2 into here, right, I get 8 minus negative 2, which is still going to be positive. So presumably, this is still going to work. So I'm pretty sure both answers are going to be acceptable. So there you go for that one. Let's, uh, let's see if we can't tack on one more logarithm problem here. Scroll over a little bit. I'll pick one, and then I will be back in a flash. OK, strange problem here. 5 times the natural log of 3x over 4 is equal to 2. So again, we have to just combine out the logarithms here and simplify it. So I'm going to kick this 5 in and make it the exponent here. So we've got natural log of 3x over 4 raised to the fifth power is equal to 2. Now, I could totally take each thing to the fifth power. I don't know if I'd want to. 3 to the fifth, I think it's like 243, and I don't remember what 4 to the fifth is. I don't know if it's going to matter, because when I get this x to the fifth, eventually I'll have to take the cube root anyway. So I think I'm going to bypass that in a couple of steps here. I am stuck in this current position. So um, what I'm going to do to get myself unstuck from this is I'm going to change forms. Please remember, the base of a natural log is e, right? So e squared is going to equal um, 3x over 4 to the fifth power. Now, this is a really strange place to be. I'm going to take the fifth root on both sides here. And so what we get is we get the fifth root of e squared. Now, strange, but believe it or not, it is a number, right? e squared is like 7 something, right? Because e is the 2.718 uh, number. So if I square that, we remember back when we graphed natural log, we got 7 point something. So that's really just the fifth root of 7 point something. So while not the most attractive number, it's still a number. And so you know, at the end of the day, we're still trying to get x by itself. So I'm going to get all the numbers out of there by multiplying by 4. So what we have is we have 4 times the fifth root of e squared. And if I just divided everything by 3, x would soon be by itself. And um, no need to worry about checking this thing because this is a positive number, right? If I take e squared's positive, if I take the fifth root of a positive number and multiply it by a positive and divide by a positive, I should get something positive. So that is section 10, some logarithmic equations. Uh, let's move on to section 11. Hang on for a second. All right, so let's take a look at section 11. We're just trying to find the domain and the zeros of each function. Now, when it comes to the domain of any function, um, usually there's only a couple of issues we can really run into, and right now, it's usually revolved around dividing by 0, taking the square root of a negative number, or the logarithm of a negative number. So since we're dealing with a square root here, that's probably going to be where our domain error occurs. I, I don't see any danger in dividing by 0 at this point. So to find the zeros also is to set the equation equal to 0 to find out where it crosses the x-axis. So let's see what we can come up with here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and set 2x cubed minus x squared. I want to find out uh, when that is greater than or equal to 0. And the reason why I'm doing that is because when, some, when an expression on the inside of the radical is greater than or equal to 0, I know that that's positive, which means that's what x can be. And so by saying it greater than or equal to 0, also I'm also finding the zeros of it, because that's, that's where the functions equal. So let's go and solve. I'm going to go and factor out an x squared here. That leaves me with 2 minus x here. Uh, greater than or equal to 0. Now, I'm in a really difficult situation because I need to find out where this thing is positive. But luckily, we have this good old friend that has come back after a long while of being gone called the sign chart. And we can go ahead and find out where this thing is positive and negative. So basically, um, my two roots are going to be 0 and 2. And I think by doing that, I've also kind of solved for the first part here. I know that my zeros are going to be 0 and 2. And then, basically, I'm going to do a sign chart on this thing. Now, here's the thing. 
x squared I really don't need to include in the sign chart because it's always positive. 2 minus x on the other hand I do need to include and it's going to follow a pattern which is a little bit which is a little bit peculiar. It's actually going to go plus plus minus because of the nature of that line, right? 2 minus x is a is a line that slopes down like that. So I want to make sure that I keep my sign straight. So basically as long as these two things are positive, then I'm then the inside of this radical is going to be happy, right? Because I can't take the square root of any negative numbers. So this is bad. I don't want that. So the interval at which I am looking for is going to be from negative infinity to uh, 2. And I can include that, and I cannot include negative infinity. So there you have it. That's the domain and range of, of number 2 in section 11. Uh, use that to apply to the other ones, and I'll be back with section 12. Section 12 says to write a piecewise function and then graph. So here's what I'm going to look at. I'm actually going to do this a little bit differently because I have this 3 here on the inside. Now we've seen this before in the trig functions where I factor that 3 out. So I'm going to see what happens when I do that here. Uh, plus 5 here now. And from here there's a, there's a cool little rule in, uh, in absolute value where I can say that this is the absolute value of 3 times the absolute value of x plus 5. And I know the absolute value of 3 is 3, so I get that being the actual function. And so from here, I can see pretty clearly that my break number is going to be negative 5. But you know, honestly, I think graphing this thing first would be the better idea. I don't really want to write the piecewise, because that's when people end up getting like that strange, disjointed uh, piecewise. But if you, had to, if you were asked this in Algebra 3, 4, you'd know uh, what it is. It's a V that is shifted to the left by 5 and it's 3 times steeper so the slope on either side is going to go up 3 and to the right by 1 so we'll go ahead and do that first so 1 2 3 4 5 that is negative 5 0 and from here I'm going to move up 1 2 3 to the right by 1 and up 3 to the left by 1 and it's going to look like that so now that that's out of the way, let's go and write this as a piecewise function. I know that it's going to be the negative version of the graph under certain conditions, and then I have the positive version of the graph under certain conditions. Now, if I look at the graph, it's easy to tell the break number is negative 5. So when x is less than negative 5, that's when I have the negative version of the line that slopes down like that. And then when x is greater than or equal to negative 5, I'll have the positive version, which is the one that shoots up like that. Again, in this case, it's not going to matter where the negative goes as long as it doesn't go on both. So that is section 12. Let me fire up section 13, and then we'll rock and roll. And here we go, section 13. We're going to find out this inequality here, where it's greater than or equal to 0. The sign chart returns. So before I do any sign chart stuff, I'm going to go ahead and go 3 minus x over x plus 2 and x minus 2. That helps me see the critical numbers a little bit better. I know that they're 3 and plus minus 2, so we can go ahead and punch that into the sign chart here. So negative 2, 2, and 3. Now I hope you guys are getting used to that sign chart because you're doing them in rational functions as well. So uh, we'll go ahead and keep on moving here. So x plus 2, x minus 2, and 3 minus x. I'll go ahead and just partition things down here. x minus 2 will break at negative 2, so minus, plus, plus, plus. x minus 2 will break at 2, so anything before is negative, anything after is positive. 3 minus x, just like the last problem, very peculiar. It's going to break at 3, except because it's 3 minus x, it's positive before and negative after. So plus, minus, plus, minus. This thing is greater than or equal to 0. These are the guys that I'm looking for. So looks like my interval is from negative infinity to negative 2 union 2 to 3 be careful I know we have this equal sign here but the negative and positive 2's are still not included because if we do we're dividing by 0 and that's bad okay cool let's uh, go and pause right there I'll jump to sections 14 and the rest in a little bit okay so it occurred to me today that um, I would be absent on the day we're supposed to cover page three of the review packet. So instead of doing a couple problems from each section um, on the other pages, I might just do a few more problems from each section here on page three, so sections eight through 13. So if I'm going to do a few of those, 
let's go ahead and let's take a look at something a little more complicated from section 8, like number 6. Number 6 goes like this. It's log base 3 of a to the 7th over uh, b cubed c. Now, with this problem here, the reason why it's more complicated is because we have some division happening with two different terms on the bottom. So what I'm going to do here, the instructions are the same. I'm going to separate this logarithm, split it up, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to call it log base 3 of a to the 7th. Now because the terms are being divided, that means that I'm really subtracting the other term. So log base 3 of b cubed and um, log base, and technically these guys are being um, multiplied, so technically I could be adding log base 3 of c. Now the problem with me writing it like this is that the two terms on bottom are being divided simultaneously. So if I'm going to write this properly, I need to make sure that there are brackets around the group being subtracted. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to finish off this problem by kicking down the 3, kicking down the 7, I end up with 7 log base 3 of a minus, oops, I just said I was going to do that, I did not, 3 log base 3 of b, and then I'll go ahead and distribute the negative and get a log base 3 of c. So that is how you successfully split up that logarithm. So again, this is section 8, number 6. Uh, let's do a, an exponential decay problem. So this is section 9, number 2. It says the decay constant for a radioactive material is negative 0 0.08042. So that means that R is going to be negative 0 0.08042 when time is measured in years. It says how many years will it take for a 250 gram sample to reduce to 50 grams. So how long will it take? That's a pretty key word there for telling me that I'm going to be solving for time. So what I've got is 250, oops, not 250, 250 over here will become 50 grams. E is going to be E, and R is this negative 0 0.08042, and T is the thing you're solving for. So let's go ahead and divide things out. So 250, blast it out. So 50 over 250 is 1 over 25, so uh, 1 over 5. So what I get here is I get 1 fifth is equal to E to the negative 0.08042t. There is no way that those are going to have the same base, so I take the natural logs of both sides. So the natural log of 1 fifth is equal to negative 0.08042t. Divide by this stuff here. And then I get natural log of 1 fifth over negative 0.08042 equals t. So if we were to put this in a decimal form, I'd round to three decimals at the end. Natural log of 1 divided by 5 divided by negative 0.08042. I am getting t to equal 20.013 years. And there you go. That's problems from sections 8 and 9. I'm going to clean off the board and get you section 10. All right, so with problem number 8 here in section 10, uh, a couple of different ways you can solve this. You can either divide out the 4 from the beginning, um, or you can kick the 4 in as the exponent of the logarithm. I'll go and just divide 4 out from the beginning. You end up getting the same thing either way. Um, so you get log base 7 of 3w plus 1 is equal to 7 halves. From here, you're stuck. So we're going to change forms. We got 7 raised to the 7 halves power is equal to 3w plus 1. And now from here, I'm going to go and just subtract 1 from both sides. So we get 7 to the 7 halves minus 1 is equal to 3w. And all you can really do now is divide by 3 and be done with the problem. So w is going to equal 7 to the 7 halves minus 1 over 3. And that's as far as you can really go without a calculator. I really wouldn't want to do 7 to the 7th power. That's large.
Okay, number 11 from the same section, log base 3 of log base 5 of x is equal to 1. So it's like we have a logarithm inside of a logarithm. It's kind of like Inception, the movie. So I'm going to, I'm stuck. So I'm going to change forms. I've got 3 as my base, 1 as my exponent. So 3 to the first is equal to log base 5 of x. And 3 to the first is really just 3, so I can go and get rid of that. And so I'm stuck again. Let's change forms again. 5 is the base, 3 is the exponent, 5 cubed is equal to x, so x would equal 125. Seemingly difficult. I don't think it was terribly complicated. Hopefully that wasn't too fast for you. And then the last problem I'll do from here is number 13 from section 10. Lots of combination happening here. Uh, log base 9 of 4x minus 1 minus log base 9 of 2x minus 7 is equal to, they call it 0.5, I'm going to call it 1 half. That makes me feel more comfortable, especially with the changing forms maneuver. I know that the bases are the same, which means that the logs are being subtracted. I can combine them out into one log base 9 where the two terms are being divided. And that's going to equal 1 half. From here, we are stuck yet again. So we'll do the same move that we did in 11, which is the same move we did in 8, which is to change forms. 9 to the 1 half is equal to 4x minus 1 over 2x minus 7. From here, 9 to the 1 half is 3. I'm going to move this thing down just a little bit. So I've got 3 equaling 4x minus 1 over 2x minus 7. Kick this dude over. I get 3 parentheses 2x minus 7 equals 4x minus 1. Let's distribute. 6x minus 21 is equal to 4x minus 1. Move stuff around. Kick this guy over. 2x. Kick this guy over. I get negative 21 uh, to be added will be 20. x will equal 10. Let's double check our answer to make sure it works because we have logarithms here with x's in the exponent, uh, in the, not the exponent, but in the answer. Positive, positive, presumed to work. I think we're good. So x should equal 10 right there. So I'm going to go ahead and jump ahead to section 13. And so with number 4 here, I love these problems because they involve inequalities, and inequalities that are nonlinear involve the sign chart. So another reason why I like this problem is because if you don't remember how to factor this top here, you're kind of up the creek. And this type of factoring always comes up right as soon as we forget about it. So I'll go ahead and give you guys the reminder. It's little bro, big bro. So I'm going to factor little bro here. And then I got big bro being x squared plus 3x plus 9 over x minus 5 is less than or equal to 0. Now at this point, hopefully we're really comfortable with the idea of the sign chart because we're doing them all across our rational functions. Um, this guy will not produce any critical numbers. If you don't remember, the discriminant of, uh, of this quadratic expression here will be negative, right? So it will produce no solution, which is actually beneficial for us in a couple of ways. One, we know, we know that no cri uh, critical numbers will come out of this expression. Two, we don't need to include this as a function in our sign chart because it's always positive. So realistically, our two critical numbers are just 3 and 5. And so here we go x minus 3, x minus 5, minus, plus, plus, minus, minus, plus. So we've got a plus, minus, plus here. Because I'm looking for things that are less than 0, I'm looking for this negative interval, which is underneath the x-axis for the rational graphers. So I'm between 3 and 5. Now, we have less than or equal to. I can include the 3 because it's up top. That means my function is 0. I cannot include 5 because 5 is on the bottom. And if I let 5, uh, if I let x become 5, I'm dividing by 0. Not good. So that's number 4. Now that I look at it, I would like to take a look at number 1 because it's, in many ways, it's so um, obvious that the first step might actually miss, uh, might be missed. And so here, a lot of people try to factor this in a crazy way, but look, they all have an x in common. 
I can factor that x out. I get x squared minus 2x minus 8. And I think this inside piece here is, in fact, factorable. So I think it's x minus 4 and x plus 2. So from here, sign chart happens again. And if you get used to the sign chart, it's pretty easy to figure out what's going to happen here. Negative 2, 0, and 4. So I got x, x minus 4, and x plus 2. So minus, minus, plus, plus, minus, 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 plus. This guy breaks at negative 2, so minus, and then plus is for the rest of the way. Minus, plus, minus, plus. We are looking for the negative intervals again, so right here and here. So I'm thinking it's going to be negative infinity to negative 2, Oops, it's a comma, union 0 to 4. And I can include everything except for infinity. There is no risk of a domain error because it's a polynomial function. Everything's defined everywhere. So that will wrap it up for section 13. I'll move on to the next page in a little bit. Hey, everybody. It looks like we have time for section 14. So I'll probably do about three graphs from here, and then, uh, and then we'll move on from there. So the first one we're going to do is I'm going to do number 2. It's y equals x minus 3 quantity squared plus 2. So uh, it's hopefully at this point you're recognizing it's a parabola because of the squared deal. The vertex is going to be at 3 comma 2, shift to the right by 3, up by 2, and so we'll center it there. We have to identify a few things like the domain range, x-intercepts, y-intercepts, and asymptotes. Uh, it'll be cool to do that, and then we have to find f inverse if it exists. Um, okay, let's get started. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick two symmetrical points. I'm going to pick 0. And if I plug in a 0, I get negative 3. Negative 3 squared is 9. 9 plus 2 is 11. So 0, 11. Because a parabola is symmetrical across its vertex, I know that 11 is going to occur again. The distance between the 0 and the 3 was back 3. So if I added 3 more, I'd get to the 11 by calling it 6. So let's go ahead and graph these points here. Uh, 3, 2. And I already know that my points are going to be way off. So 0, 11. I'll just go ahead and throw that up there. Uh, I think you guys get the gist of it. And then 4, 5, 6, 11. Let's throw that there as well. And then you just connect the points together. And that's all you, whoa, that's all you really need to do. Whoa again. Okay. So let's talk about domain and range and all that stuff for this thing. The domain of a parabola is all real numbers. So that's pretty straightforward. The range, well, the lowest place it could be would be 2. So it would be the set of y such that y is greater than or equal to 2. Right, the lowest point on the, on the parabola is this two point right here. Um, x intercept. Well, we can find that in a second, but I think the y intercept was already found. It's 0, 11. We found that by plugging this really easy number here. The x intercept will be found by, um, by setting this equation equal to 0, or I can look at this right here and say that there's none. So from here, finding any asymptotes, there are no asymptotes. And then f inverse will not exist. So I'll put dne for does not exist. And hopefully you guys know the reason why. It is because f of x is not 1 to 1. OK? All right, so I'm going to clean up the board real quick, and then I will get the next graph up there. So not very often that we get to see a secant of 2x problem or any kind of secant graph. So I'll go ahead and take care of this one here. Uh, pretty basic. I mean, there, there's no vertical shift or amplitude change, at least not for cosine, right, because secant doesn't have an amplitude. Uh, but there is a period change here. And with, with secant's frequency, uh, period normally being 2 pi, the new period of this thing will be 2 pi over 2, which is pi. And I'll go and graph one full period and then some like we always do. But before I do that, I'm actually going to go ahead and graph cosine first. And I know the cosine goes up to 1 and down to negative 1. I'll go ahead and sketch cosine. One full period right there. I know that this is now pi. Halfway between is pi over 2. 
halfway between the halfway is pi over 4, and then 3 pi over 4 is 3 quarters of the way. I'm going to do my slither in the back, and I end up with um, negative pi over 4 here. I'm going to change colors, because now I'm going to be drawing secant, which is going to be in this magenta-esque color. Asymptotes for secant are always where cosine equals 0. Cosine is going to equal 0 where cosine crosses the x-axis. So here we go. There are your vertical asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes right there. And then from there, everything just kind of gets turned over. Whoa. Okay, so there we go. So let's talk about the all the domain range, x, y intercepts, and blah, blah, blah. So the domain complicated. It's, it's as if it wants to be all real numbers, right? I wish it could be, but it can't. x, though, cannot be... Well, the first iteration of asymptote happens at pi over 4. And then the next one happens at 3 pi over 4. And the next one would happen, presumably, at 5 pi over 4, then 7 pi over 4. So it looks like I'm adding 2 pi over 4 every single time. In other words, pi over 2n. And that's going to be plus or minus pi over 2n, where n is equal to 0, 1, 2, dot, dot, dot. The range is going to be from negative infinity to negative 1. I can include, but I can't include the, the infinity, union, 1 to infinity. If you wanted to see this in set notation, it would be y is less than or equal to negative 1, or y is greater than or equal to positive 1. There are no x-intercepts. And the y-intercept, the only one that happens, is 0, 1. Asymptotes, well, we kind of covered that, right? Asymptotes, that's at x equals pi over 4 plus minus pi over 2n, where n is equal to 0, 1, 2, dot, dot, dot. And then f inverse. Well, luckily, not one to one again. So, none. Okay, there goes number six for you. Let's uh, erase this and come back with the last graph. And what graphing session would be complete without the beloved natural log graph? And so here we go. Not only do we have a natural log graph, we have a natural log graph that is being shifted to the left by 2. So that is going to impact our answers in a very peculiar kind of way. So with natural logs, just like radicals, there are certain numbers that I can't plug in, and then there are certain numbers that I really should plug in. And so the lowest number I can plug in, and I'm going to say plug in with quotation marks around my face, and that is I can plug in a negative 2, and I put that in quotation marks because I really can't, right? Because that would get me a 0 in here, which would get me undefined. Now, I put that in there because I'm not really plugging in the negative 2, right? I know that that is going to be where my vertical asymptote is. And now from here, what I want to do is I want to pick numbers that are going to be workable for this natural log function. Negative 1 will work, because a negative 1 will get me a 1 in here, which will get me a 0. And now I'm going to start plugging in things that have the same base as our natural logarithm. Natural log's base is e. e would normally get me a 1 here, I, and that's what I want. I want to create a 1. But if I throw in an e, there's this plus 2 that gets in its way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw down an e minus 2. Now, e minus 2, we have to remember that value. e is about 2.718. So minus 2, 2.71. Minus 2 is about 0 0.71. So that's about right there. I'm going to call it e minus 2, comma 1. This is going to be 1, comma, oh, sorry, negative 1, comma 0. Another point would be e squared. Because e squared would normally get me 2, right? But it's got to be e squared minus 2. Because I want the negative 2 and the positive 2 to cancel each other out. That way I end up with just e squared on the inside. That's definitively going to get us 2. Now e squared is 7 something. 
minus 2 is 5 something. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 something, and 2. So that's going to be e squared minus 2 comma 2. So at this point, I want some negative values. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start plugging in values like e to the negative 1 or 1 over e. But I also have to include that minus 2. Now normally that would just give me a negative 1, right? But now I have to kind of figure out what this e to the negative 1 minus 2 is. So e to the negative 1, 1 over e, that's 1 divided by 2.71. That's about a third. About a third minus 2 is about negative 1 and 2 thirds, about right there. That's going to be e to the negative 1 minus 2 comma negative 1. I'm going to do the same thing for e to the negative 2, or 1 over e squared. Subtract 2 from that. I get a negative 2 out. And again, it's just ever so slightly closer, right there. So e to the negative 2 minus 2 comma negative 2. And now I just link them together as accurately as possible. OK? So let's go ahead and find all the necessary information. So the domain of this thing is going to be the set of x such that x has to be greater than, not greater than or equal to, but greater than negative 2. Remember, that's why I said we plugged in a 2 with the quotation marks here. The range is all real numbers. Uh, let's see, the x-intercept is going to be, let's see, the x-intercept is going to be negative 1, 0. The y-intercept is going to take a little bit of math. Y-intercept happens when we let x become 0, but actually not as much math as I thought. 0, comma, natural log of 2. The asymptotes is x equals negative 2. And I believe this one does have an f inverse. I think it does. So if it does, let's find it. So let's switch over to ketchup. Uh, x is equal to ln of y plus 2. So now I'm stuck. I'm going to change forms. e to the x is equal to y plus 2. So I end up with y equals e to the x minus 2 as the inverse function of the natural log. So there you have it. Those are your three graphs. Let's move on to the next section. All right, so in section 15, we are dealing with this thing. It is called the difference quotient, which is this formula right here. And it's a formula you're going to want to get used to seeing often. You're going to see it quite a bit in when we hit the AP Calc quarter. And actually, when you boil it down, it's actually a formula you've seen for a long time. And uh, you just haven't really recognized it in this presentation before. But when you see it, you'll, you'll see it. So I'm going to apply the difference quotient to this function number 2 here, f of x. The way I see the difference quotient is I always say it's modified minus original divided by h. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply that idea. Modified is f of x plus h, which means I'm going to take an x plus h and plug it in for x. So what I get is 5 minus 7, not x, but x plus h now. And when I subtract the original, I'm subtracting literally the whole thing, this whole original right here. So 5 minus 7x. Now, I have to be very careful, because if I'm subtracting the whole thing here, I have to remember to put the parentheses, and it's being divided by the h on the bottom. From here, it's just some algebra. I've got to simplify this. I've got 5 minus 7x minus 7h minus 5. Careful, distribute the negative plus 7x. From here, hopefully you can see some things that are going to get out of here. Fives, gone. Negative sevens, gone. That leaves you with negative 7h over h. Goodbye to the h's, you end up with negative 7. Let's do, let's do one more, like number 3. So f of x is equal to x squared minus 4. So again, applying the difference quotient will be the modified x plus h minus the original. What does modified look like? Modified replaces the x with an x plus h instead. x plus h quantity squared, not x squared. x plus h quantity squared minus 4. That's the modified 
Now I'm going to subtract the original, x squared minus 4. Got to be careful not to make the same mistake as I was about to up there, because I'm subtracting the whole thing, all divided by h. Now, simplifying this is going to require a little bit more legwork. x plus h quantity squared is not x squared plus h squared. It is actually a FOIL problem, so x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus 4 minus x squared plus 4 up top. Again, distributing the negative. Goodbye to the x squareds. Goodbye to the 4s. That leaves us with 2xh plus h squared over h. Notice how both terms have an h in common. You can either divide down or you can factor the h out. I prefer factoring. That's just kind of what I do. Goodbye to the h's. You are left with 2x plus h as the answer. And there you go. Section 15 done for you. Be back in a flash. So in section 16, we are being asked to determine if a function is even or odd. Now, remember, a function is even if you plug in negative x, right? If you're looking at Jack's back, while looking at Jack's back, if you're looking at Jack's front, you have an even function. If you plug in Jack's back, if you look at Jack's back, and you get upside down Jack, you're odd. So let's see. What about number two? If I plug in f of negative x, what do I get? I get negative x to the fourth minus 6 times negative x squared minus 7. If I simplify this out, negative x to the fourth will become positivized. Negative x squared will become positivized, but it doesn't change the fact that it's being subtracted by the 6, or by the 6x. Minus 7. So here's what we have. I'm looking at Jack's back, and it looks like I'm looking at also Jack's front. This function is even. Number three, f of negative x is equal to negative x all to the fifth power minus one. Seemingly odd, however, the fifth power will allow the negative to survive. I get negative x to the fifth minus one. There's nothing I can do here. I mean, if I, fact, if I factored out the negative, I get x to the fifth plus one, which is not anything remotely like what I had before. So by looking at Jack's back, I'm actually looking at something else. So this is no, not even nor odd. It's, it's neither. All right, so that takes care of that section right there. Back in a flash.